hello, welcome everybody to this uh, second uh, webinar of this series that we uh, at SICAM have decided to, to put forward during these times that we are facing this crisis and hello, in which uh, we thought that it was, it was uh, a good opportunity webinar of the, to, uh, to have to create this new channel of communication to bring people with uh, quite a broad uh, background to know about activities in the context of uh, modeling computational efforts uh, to fight or to understand better what's behind uh, COVID. And in this, uh, today, we, we will devote the, the webinar to uh, a European consortium that has been created uh, for the purpose of precisely using computational powers and tools to analyze efficiently uh, drugs and molecules that are relevant or can be relevant in the fight against COVID. That's called Excalate. So it is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce the, the three speakers we will have today. Uh, Andrea Beccari, who is the coordinator of, uh, of the project, who works in Dompe, and he will introduce uh, the project. And then afterwards, we will have a presentation by Carmine Talarico, also in Dompe, who will talk about the computational tasks associated to this project. And finally, after the small break, Julia Rossetti, Julich, the Computing Center will be uh, talking about computational approaches to, to drug repurposing. So I thank them for coming here to, to share this, this initiative. And I think it, it's quite uh, engaging. So I, I hope you also find it uh, interesting and participate. I remind you that the we structure these webinars in a dynamic way. So you can uh, post questions uh, and comments during the presentations using the corresponding uh, part in the, in the YouTube channel. So, and then um, I didn't introduce Sara Bonella, who is the, the deputy director myself. We will be uh, chairing the session. So we will take care of uh, getting the questions and structuring them. So then after the presentation, there will be a common uh, session for questions and discussion. And again, you can address questions directly to any uh, of them specifically, or you can also address more general questions uh, with the idea there can be interventions uh, among them and create a bit of a dialogue uh, around what they will have presented. In case you have difficulties in posing the questions through this YouTube uh, page, you can also send questions to, by email to the email address director at ccam.org. So I repeat, director at ccam.org. And again, we will get these questions and we will combine them with the ones uh, that we will see in the, in the chat uh, and then organize the corresponding discussion session. Um, I also wanted to uh, remind you that all these uh, webinars are, and now they are live and afterwards we store them in our CCAM website so that you can come back to, to check or revisit them if you want at any time, and as well see the one, for example, of last week or the ones that we will have in the coming two weeks, we will be organizing two additional uh, webinars. And finally, I, I, this is in the, I, I like to also emphasize that this is as usual for CCAM and community effort and open to everybody. So we are always uh, eager to receive uh, comments and suggestions from anybody interested. And also in the YouTube, you now we have added a link where you can subscribe to receive any information related to this initiative if you have not received it uh, already by other dissemination channels. So this is, uh, hope this will be an interesting session today. So without further uh, issues, then let's start with the first presentation by Andrea Beccari, who will be presenting this initiative. Andrea, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So first of all, I want to thank the organizer for uh, giving the opportunity to our project uh, and our TV to be presented uh, in this uh, in such an important uh, event. I am the coordinator of the, of the Escalate project. It's a European-funded 
uh, project for uh, uh, fighting uh, uh, COVID. So first of all, I want to emphasize that uh, this consortium is a fully integrated pan-European drug discovery infrastructure. And you can see from the map that we have uh, a good coverage of uh, 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 the Europe uh, involving uh, uh, many different countries uh, and different kind of uh, institutions. The project collect the consortium collects uh, 18 institutions, and at the moment we have more than 200 researchers involved in all our research activities. The structure of the project, uh, due to the specific issue that uh, we are going uh, to, uh, to address, uh, is uh, organized in uh, uh, very straight uh, uh, task forces with very specific uh, role. The, the entire project will run for 18 months. So the most important uh, uh, part of the project is devoted to identification of the effective treatments. And for this, we have two task forces dedicated that collect different work packages. One uh, is the computer aided drug design that is part of the rest of the discussion uh, uh, today. Then we have uh, a task force uh, dedicated uh, to the phenotypic uh, and biochemical screening uh, of the compounds for the pilation up to animal model testing. Then we have two activities that are very related to the computational effort. And one uh, is dedicated to X-ray, so the structure, the, the determination of three-dimensional structure or the, the um, viral proteins and eventually bound with the ligand that we are going to identify. And then we have a dedicated task force to have a full support of the three supercomputer centers in Europe, Cineca, Ulich, and BSC, to <clears throat> ensure that in all the part of the project, we have uh, the, um, all the capacity in terms of calculation uh, is needed to perform our, uh, our simulation. And then, very important, the last uh, block of activities is devoted to the, trans the, the transition of the result of this consortium to clinics and uh, <clears throat> for the establishment of a broader network to support uh, internal activities and further development of the result of the project. The project workflow and goals are very uh, easy and straightforward, as I mentioned. So the first part of the project that we call phase one is devoted to identification of immediate response to already infected people. For this task, we are collecting from many sources, drugs in a clinical investigation already on the market, and they will test in our phenotypic and biochemical screening. Then we will characterize this molecule, the mechanism of action, and in the preclinical setup. This molecule, already being exposed to the humans, will be immediately discussed with the European Medical Agency in order to start, as soon as possible, a clinical trial. In the second phase of the project, we will use the information derived from the identification of reporposed drug to optimize and enhance the quality of our model. And then we will screen, screen huge libraries of novel compounds that we can go in the same uh, preclinical characterization like the drugs. In this case, the development of novel drugs is out of the scope of the consortium. But uh, as mentioned, we are looking for partners that can take care of the results that we have to have the fasted uh, follow-up to clinics also for molecules uh, uh, completely new on, uh, in, uh, in the field. I want to spend uh, a minute to an initiative that we have started in the project uh, with the support of uh, the European Commission, uh, namely the DG Connect, and the uh, European Federation of Industry or Pharmaceutical Industry in, in Europe. We launched an initiative where 
research group in, in, uh, mainly in Europe and pharmaceutical company can test, can test their own compound in our facility to support and enhance the capability of the consortium in finding novel drugs. So please have a look at our website and uh, ask us uh, additional information if you, if you are interested in, uh, in uh, participating uh, in, in the project testing uh, compound in our in our facility. So actually, is anything I don't want to uh, take time for the, the, the specific presentation uh, of today, say so pass uh, the, the, um, the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Andrea, for this uh, general introduction to, to create the, the framework of, of this initiative. And uh, as uh, Andrea himself has mentioned, now we will move on to the, to the following speaker, who uh, Carmine Tararico, who will be uh, discussing in more detail the computational activities associated or which are, will be developed within this uh, project. So uh, Carmine, now it's uh, your turn. Thank you. Okay, can you see the video? Okay, thanks yes. a lot for uh, for uh, this opportunity to share with you um, our consortium, our project, and um, as uh, um, Andrea already introduced. Uh, um, a very important point of this project is certainly the possibility of combining theoretical and experimental methods in an harmonious and closely way. And for this reason, task forces have been created that have the ability to support and integrate into, into each other. And um, as you can see here, um, there is a block that deals uh, with findings and the real treatment, another one useful to increase and support the, the quality of, uh, of the simulation. And finally, um, a very important block that deals with making all the discoveries available for the, for the community. So um, let's move in um, and let's uh, take a look in depth to the task force 1.1, uh, the task force of the drug uh, design. With this workflow, I want to give you an idea on how we uh, thought the um, computational IDED drug discovery pipeline, but it is obvious that there are um, internal collaborations such as in the docking and dataset selection, for example, in which mut multiple groups make available their skills and competencies to reach the better results. In this case, the work package one, uh, the, the one in which the, the, our task force is, is working, um, in this work package is taking care of the activity expected to exploit the Excalate platform to select and make available the most promising active molecules to be tested in, bio, in biochemical and uh, phenotypic assay. The whole structure has been designed to obtain reliable models of viral proteins, starting from um, uh, homology models uh, and experimental structures uh, that can be optimized by using molecular dynamics simulation. These um, structures uh, then will be ready for the uh, virtual screening uh, protocols. And so, um, Two sets of simulation will be carried out um, at different scale to virtual screen in a first phase, the repurposing library, um, such as Dompe, safe main library, or uh, the broad front offer uh, library uh, to identify the most promising safe main drugs ready for an immediate treatment uh, of the infected population. And in a second phase, we will um, virtual screen the Dompe um, tangible 
tangible chemical spaces that have trillions of synthetic accessible compounds with the aim to identify new potential panacoronavirus inhibitors. So, um, as mentioned before, um, the communication between the various task, task forces will be uh, uh, the strength of the, of the project. Here, for example, it is reported that there is a close correlation between the groups that deal with genomics and sequencing and those interested in the generation of uh, 3D uh, protein models. This aspect will be fundamental in the case of uh, uh, viral mutation, for example. And uh, um, this type of, of, of close collaboration between task forces allowed us to identify the proteins with higher interest in, uh, in the very early stage of the COVID-19 emergency. And these protein were then immediately made available for the computational task force. We are facing this emergency uh, step by step. In fact, uh, at this early stage, we're, focus uh, we're focusing our efforts on one of the most uh, appealing targets, the 3CL uh, protease. In, in this sense, we are proceeding with the validation of the identified protocol to have a virtual screening phase as accurate as possible. This phase, um, which must be carried out without haste, um, as we are seeing around and carefully, will allow us to get a valid protocol that can be deployed to other uh, viral proteins. So um, let's check it out how uh, this task force works. And uh, in this first case, the group of uh, Professor uh, Giulio Vistoli from the University of Milan um, is carrying out a careful analysis of the viral um, uh, protein binding sites. In particular, um, the information obtained from the subtask will be essential for molecular connection studies, of course. And this activity is mainly, is mainly carried out in two ways, uh, literature-based binding site analysis and an automated binding site analysis. In the first case, um, our research was carried out on a scientific publication, which highlighted the presence of binding site well-conserved um, among homologous viral proteins in which uh, regions were occupied by orthosteric and or uh, allosteric ligands. And in, in the second case uh, has been combined a classical procedure to find a pocket cavity, um, a pocket cavity on the protein surface and another one basing on a docking procedure that use a ligand as a probe in order to find the so-called draggable uh, sites. From an internal benchmarks, it has been highlighted how by combining the two methods, it is possible to blindly identify almost all the known sites um, scored among the uh, top ranked. The molecular dynamics groups um, uh, in which belong guys came in from uh, Chineca and uh, and Dompe um, is working uh, by using um, Gromax software as, a, uh, as, as, as software, the Gromax 2020 version, and, and applying um, the software onto distinct clusters. And as you can see here, we had um, a huge amount of computational services that allowed us to simulate in parallel high numbers of biological systems. So here we reported data set containing viral proteins selected for the MD simulation studies, and that contains the so-called active interest proteins and low interest proteins. In particular, this is the list of the protein we are uh, simulating. And as you can see here, we are focused focusing uh, our attention also on uh, a heteromeric form of uh, these proteins. 
in this case, all the uh, molecular dynamics simulation are ongoing and almost all the systems had already reached at least one microseconds. And among these, some have reached or exceeded uh, the two microseconds. And we are planning to push up the, the simulation times toward the 10 microseconds. And uh, it's very important to share with you that the, uh, the, the trajectories of the simulation carried out till now will be released shortly in a, in a public repository. So uh, the molecular dynamic analysis um, is carried out by using two main methods, uh, cluster analysis and PCA methods. And I want to um, highlight how the, the Eric Lindell groups that held the, the, the previous webinar um, are supporting us by using the um, Markov state model simple methods. So um, on this, I will be very fast, and then uh, I, I will leave the, the floor to Julia Rossetti, who will show in more details the data sets used for the docking studies and some of the results obtained by, by their group. These are the um, docking software that we are using in our um, docking experiments. And in particular, um, Ligen is um, a proprietary software developed by Dompe. Uh, Pelé uh, was developed by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in the group uh, of uh, Victor Galar. And Glide, Fred, and Plants are the, um, one of the most known docking software. And um, we are currently uh, completing the validation phase of screening protocol based on enrichment factor uh, studies. As uh, um, Andrea uh, already mentioned, um, a very important aspect that I want to show you is the creation of the, the drug box. And this tool really gives a sense of how much uh, the short information can be very powerful weapon in an emergency situation like the one uh, who, where we are in uh, today. And uh, in this case, the drug box will allow us to expand the quantity of molecules which are already in advanced st stages uh, to be tested experimentally. So uh, with Drugbox, we are asking to the pharmaceutical companies, biotech or public institution to select from their internal chemical collection samples of drugs in a clinical phase or uh, already on the market and send them to Escalate for COVID um, project. It's, uh, this is uh, uh, very, very easy. So you can go on our website, create an account, and then you can submit a structural file on our, uh, by using our uh, Dropbox submission form. Then we will check if we already have the, these real uh, samples. If not, we ask to, to ship um, the, the compounds. And um, um, at the moment, 28 different centers um, submitted their uh, molecules, and but these number are uh, increasing uh, every day. And uh, in this last slide, I want to uh, share you this important information. So um, as a consortium, uh, we reached an agreement with the International Journal of Molecular Sciences to have a special issue that collects all the works produced under the um, Excalate for Coronavirus uh, virus project. And um, this special issue is already open uh, for the submission. And after the deadline, the works will be collected in, uh, in a book. So if anyone uh, is interested in, uh, please, um, please let us know. And uh, thank you for, uh, thank you, thank you. 
Okay, Carmine, thank you for this uh, description of, of how you are organized and which type of uh, activities you have uh, carrying out related to the use of computational resources to study these molecules that are relevant and the corresponding drugs. Uh, so as um, I mentioned at the beginning, we will now make a short break uh, before we move on to the, to the last presentation by Julia. Uh, so uh, I would uh, invite you to come back at a quarter to, five, uh, to four and we will then start with Julia uh, then for the last presentation, okay? Thank you very much, stay with us. See you in uh, 15 minutes.
Hello, uh, everybody. Welcome back to the uh, second part of today's webinar. And as uh, I explained at the beginning, uh, we will start now with a presentation by Julia Rossetti on computational approaches to dog repurposing. And we will continue with the discussion session where uh, we will be basically relaying the questions that you may have. I remind you that you can post your questions on the chat that you have on the YouTube channel, or you can email us to the email address director at ccam.org. Uh, so therefore, we'll start now, and I give now the floor to Julia for her presentation. Julia, please. OK, so I hope that uh, you can see my screen. Yes. So uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, the SICAM or uh, organizer for this uh, really nice uh, event and also for giving us the possibility to share our I will mostly present the result that we got in Yulish, but I will also show you uh, I will also show you essentially a uh, few of the results uh, that we are in general obtaining in the in the computational task. So the first concept that is important for me to establish is that uh, uh, drug design can be a long process and the use of computational uh, uh, methods can speed up every stage of, uh, of the drug design pipeline. And uh, Today, I will mostly focus on what we are doing in our consortium for actually uh, speed up the initial state of this pipeline, that is the drug discovery stage. And the reason why we can do this is that uh, despite uh, drugs uh, is uh, uh, administered at uh, the level of the patient's level and uh, its effect is, uh, let's say, checked at the level of the organ and maybe tissue level, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the effect of drugs is, is uh, uh, exerted by interacting at molecular level with the target. And uh, I believe around uh, uh, 10 years ago, it was established a very important concept in molecular medicine, that is the fact that every disease starts at molecular level, and thus ultimately every cure has to be achieved at molecular level. And when you go at molecular level, the uh, rules uh, that govern the, 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 the interaction among molecules are physics-based. And that's why physics-based approach, together with the data, database approach, are uh, currently uh, having, uh, uh, are currently playing a major role in the stack for drug, the, the drug repurposing. Another aspect that is relevant in the use of computational approach is the speed. So you should think about that usually we have uh, around, uh, in the human body, we have around 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth uh, proteins that we can, uh, uh, or in general, biomolecule that we can target. The ones that are uh, probably relevant for the disease that you're looking at uh, would be a very small amount, so usually less than 10. And to this very small uh, conformational space of the target, you have to couple an incredibly, an incredibly huge chemical space of potential drugs that is, uh, I mean, the 10 to the 10 to 20. So the potential chemical space of all the possible drug, uh, drug active molecule is very huge. It is true that at the end, the ones that are usually publicly accessible are 10 to the 6, and the ones that actually are biological and relevant for your target are usually around 10 to the fourth, but still among this 10 to the first compound, you need to find maybe the two, three molecules that selectively bind to your target and that uh, uh, decrease, uh, I mean, uh, that do not bind to so many other targets in order to have uh, as much as uh, possible uh, or decreasing in adverse side effect. You can do this experimentally, sure. There are uh, several, uh, experimental uh, high throughput screening procedure, but uh, these are usually uh, relatively uh, uh, expensive. And, uh, and most importantly, um, for each uh, uh, screening, uh, you have to retailer the assay for the target. And not all the target are suitable uh, to be uh, experimentally screening. So in this respect, the use of computational approach can be uh, extremely relevant to, to speed up uh, at least uh, this uh, process of matching the huge chemical space of possible molecule with the 
specific target of your interest. Now, in the, in the field of the coronavirus, uh, the, the space of, uh, of the target is relatively well defined. It is true that we don't yet know all about this virus, but we do know that uh, it is uh, enclosed in a membrane. So we have uh, membrane proteins among which we, we have also the spike proteins that uh, mediate the interaction of the virus with the host. We have uh, the envelope that is in involved in the proteins that is involved in the uh, budding. We have nucleocapsid that condense the viral genomic RNA. And then we have all a set of proteins that are involved in viral gene expression and replication. And among which the protein that I, I chose today as uh, for the purpose of, uh, of this presentation is uh, one of the, I mean, um, most known so far, that is the 3CL uh, main protease. So since January, several structures have been deposited for this protein. And the ones that you see represented here is the, is, uh, the ones uh, uh, in complex with a non-covalent inhibitor. You see also that the structure has been on purpose uh, overlapped with the ones of uh, the SARS-CoV-1, that is uh, the, uh, of another protease belonging to the same family of this virus. And you can see that this class of protein in this respect is very much conserved not only from a structural point of view, I mean, the folding is identical, but also from uh, the sequence point of view. So we have uh, uh, at, the, at the site of the, in the binding site, we have almost uh, a perfect match despite one amino acid. So we can assume that uh, also the SARS-CoV-2 protease has a similar mechanism of function of the SARS-CoV-1 protease that was already known to us. So probably we are uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, on a charged cysteine histidine catalytic diode embedded in a chemotrypsin like protease fold. And it is clear that this class of protein works uh, uh, with an induced fit type of mechani uh, mechanism in the sense that you upon binding of the ligand, the protein further readapt to the ligand. And then you have the generation of the cysteine histidine with ionic uh, uh, couple that facilitate the reaction. Now, Given this similarity uh, for, uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 with the SARS-CoV-1, uh, we try to exploit uh, this information for the library selection. So uh, when you are setting up a computational protocol, it is very much important that this protocol is validated against, exper against experiments. But since, uh, as I said, the, the protein is relatively, relatively new, that you have to rely on the, uh, we, we rely the first, uh, as well, uh, I mean, especially in the first place, on what was known for uh, the, uh, uh, for the inhibition strategy of, uh, the, uh, of the SARS-CoV-1. And uh, in this respect, we have identified, uh, uh, actually, this was a, a, a terrific word of, uh, work, especially from, uh, from Candida Manelfi, from Don Pei, that uh, uh, together uh, with uh, the group in here in Julich and also with the ones in Barcelona, uh, identify essentially four main uh, repository of compounds that we know to be uh, active against the SARS-CoV-1. These compounds are experimental. This means that for all these compounds, we have an experimental affinity measured as uh, uh, IC50 OKI. And these are the GHDDI dataset that is essentially an acronym for the Global Health Depository uh, Database that uh, uh, include 574 compounds, the integrity uh, compounds that are actually come from the internal library from Dompe and from Hofer. The GoStars library that actually is one of the uh, company that uh, answered to our call of the uh, drug box explained before by, by Carmine that uh, uh, include 500, around 500 compounds. And then we collect all the compounds so far tested against SARS-CoV-1 prote uh, uh, protease in the literature. Of course, uh, this, uh, uh, this ensemble has uh, uh, this, uh, these groups of, uh, of library, of experimental library uh, present uh, uh, some overlaps. But this is normal and it's also uh, reassuring because it means that, uh, 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 I mean, experimental tests coming from different sources uh, more or less reach uh, uh, similar uh, 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 chemical spaces. And uh, um, 
And what we did is try to understand how our, let's say, uh, protocol were able to, uh, how good our protocol were able to reproduce the experimental uh, affinity of this, uh, uh, of this experimental library. Now, uh, it is also worth to, to say that uh, in the last uh, uh, weeks, in the last two weeks, uh, also uh, 22 compounds for uh, actually our, uh, uh, our um, so, uh, SARS-CoV-2 protease are available. And these were already present in our database. And uh, you can see that uh, our assumption of, uh, and this you can see represented here, and uh, our assumption of considering uh, the uh, experimental uh, uh, set of compound targeting SARS-1 as also, uh, uh, let's say, suitable for SARS-2, uh, uh, is uh, uh, relatively good, but still we have some uh, exception. Oh, sorry for the low quality of this picture. And, uh, um, and you can see that there are some com compounds for which the, the, the PSC50 is comparable, but some other for which some difference can be, uh, can be found. And this could be due uh, of different mechanism of action, but can also be due of different assay because, as you know, the IC50 is a measure of the affinity that is a strongly assay dependent. So, when we set out our protocol, essentially, what does it mean? It means that we need to understand how the recognition, even between the uh, the possible drugs in our target, of course. And when you uh, when you deal with a, a process of molecular recognition, usually this is dictated by energy-based uh, uh, forces. So essentially, the complex that has lower potential energy than its constituent part is also the ones uh, uh, is the one that is more probable to find. Uh, to find, uh, I mean, in in vivo conditions. So the goal of the computational docking is to find the three-dimensional configuration that minimizes this, uh, this complex. And therefore, uh, you can find uh, several, uh, let's say, type uh, of, uh, you can apply several docking, uh, docking algorithms, and each of them will have a different type of searching algorithm whose scope is only the ones to generate uh, all the possible configuration between the ligand and the target. The real problem is that when you, uh, when you deal with uh, uh, computational docking, it's very challenging to then under, uh, provide a uh, correct score for the complex that you generate. In other words, if you see the picture here represented in this slide, and if I would ask to any of you which is the best complex, you will immediately indicate to me that the ones in the lower right part of the screen is the best one. But uh, for a docking algorithm, uh, and it is very challenging to distinguish, it's, it's very easy to discard the, uh, the high energy compound, but it's very challenging to distinguish between uh, complex that are very similar in, in, uh, in energy. In other words, the, uh, when the energy uh, between uh, too complex is small enough, this can go beyond the, uh, the accuracy of the docking methodology. And indeed, when you try our experimental library uh, with the different docking software, I will show that the result at the beginning were not really promising. So uh, there is not, a, uh, I mean, what we are doing in our, in our consortium is trying to apply as much as possible uh, docking algorithm characterized by different searching and uh, uh, scoring function in order to uh, to have, uh, let's say, independent approach. And the ones that I will show you today are mostly uh, Fred, uh, the, the Fred and Glide docking algorithm uh, from OpenAI and Schrodinger distribution, respectively, that are the ones uh, used in, uh, in Ulish. So when you uh, score the, uh, the experimental library with these two uh, software, and then you you look at uh, how they correlate with the PIC50, you can see that uh, there is uh, actually no correlation in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, a group of molecules that are high affinity and that uh, uh, are uh, nicely scored uh, as uh, a good binder by Fred and by Glide. But you can also see that here there is uh, a huge amount of compound that is not so good binder for our for our uh, uh, for our target that actually uh, is scored not so bad by 
both thread and glide. So in other words, there is not a real correlation in this respect between the scoring function of the docking and the experimental affinity. Now, it's not that we expected to find this. It is true that we are comparing the data with IC50 measurement that are very challenging, uh, uh, let's say, estimators of the affinity by themselves. So they are asset dependent and it's very challenging to compare even IC50 coming for the same molecules coming from different experiments. So we didn't expect to find a good correlation in any case with the, with the, with the docking score. But still, we do expect that if a complex, so between a ligand and a target is an high affinity complex, we expect that most of the docking software is able to, to recognize this. And therefore, we decided to, to select two training sets among the experimentally measured compounds that are supposed to be active against our, uh, our target. One where we only consider the very good band. So we put a cutoff of PIC50 higher than six. But you can see by yourself uh, from the distribution of the PIC50 in the experimental data set that by doing so, we cut a huge part of the conformational uh, of the chemical space. So we, we really uh, leave behind a lot of compounds. Therefore, we establish also a second training set with a less restrictive cutoff, just because especially when you are in the phase of establishing a protocol is never good to, I mean, to be, so, to be so drastic because you might lose from the beginning important part of the chemical space. So when we did so, once we fixed the training set, we use this training set to train, of course, our, our docking protocol. And we use essentially two estimator that unfortunately are, uh, unfortunately are correlated for the quality of our screening. One is the uh, rock curve that is essentially is a, a representation of the how good performing is your model. It's a measure of the positive rate of the true positive rate with respect to the false positive rate. In other words, higher is uh, the, uh, the distance between the curve and the di diagonal and better is supposed to be your prediction more your curve is cross by to the, the, the uh, diagonal and more your prediction is uh, similar to a random guessing. And the second measure that we use is the enrichment factor. In other words, what we did, we put uh, molecules that, that we know are active, the molecules from the training set that we discussed before, that we know are active in our screening procedure. And then we measure how many of these molecules come out at the end of the docking procedure. So how many active molecules that we know are active ended up in our screenings. And this tells us how good is our protocol in recognizing the active molecules. So we did this with uh, OpenAI software. And you can clearly see that uh, the quality of our docking is uh, strongly dependent uh, on the training set. So for OpenAI, if you use a training set that uh, is mostly composed by high affinity compound, the uh, performance uh, is better than the ones that you obtain when you uh, use a training set include, that include also not so good uh, binders. But uh, the results are uh, uh, even a little bit different if you go with the glide score, uh, with the glide score in Schrodinger. So you can see here that uh, uh, even if we use uh, or not so or, or training set composed by not so good binder. In any case, uh, the algorithm appears to be uh, able to select in the top uh, 1%, 0.5% of huge amount of active molecule. And this becomes even better uh, if you use uh, on high affinity training set. Now, of course, uh, uh, we are still investigating how much uh, uh, is the difference of the chemical space uh, with respect to the result, but this is uh, for sure a good starting point, considering that uh, we did uh, all this uh, starting uh, only from, uh, from the X-ray. Now, it comes to our mind that uh, uh, by doing so, of course, we are not considering the protein flexibility. Therefore, we try to, to, to redo the entire proceed uh, proceeding also using the uh, structure coming from the molecular simulation uh, package. 
when we did so, we remain uh, at the beginning uh, uh, surprised by uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the performance of our algorithm strongly decreased. In other words, while in the X-ray, we were even able to find the back uh, structure that were uh, actually uh, among the active molecules uh, for the SARS-CoV-2, when we did this from the, uh, by using, uh, let's say, frames coming from the, from the MD, you can see that the performance strongly dropped almost uh, to zero. And uh, the reason why is that uh, uh, this protease uh, has a very flexible uh, uh, part uh, um, that compose the binding site. You can see that uh, where it is the ligand, there are two flanking regions that are mostly unstructured and that actually uh, are extremely flexible in the simulation. Now, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is a, a clusterization that was uh, kindly provided by us uh, from the group of uh, Eric Lindahl and was done on the that we show trajectory. And you can see that uh, if you analyze the configurations of, uh, the, of, the, of the flanking uh, uh, region to the, to the binding site, the upper part of the flanking region is relatively rigid. So independently of the, of the cluster that you are looking at, this loop uh, tends to remain relatively uh, stable and close. So the classification was done, of course, on the distance, I forgot to say. But on the other way around, if you look on the uh, lower flaps here, on the lower loop, you can see that there are mostly two configuration of the loop denoted here as blue and orange, where blue denote close conformation and orange open conformation. And you can see that uh, um, this is much more uh, uh, flexible. And uh, it is also clear that uh, depending on the configuration of this loop, the, the volume and the, uh, the accessibility, as well as the uh, really the, the, the um, of, the conformation of the binding site can dramatically change. And uh, that's why in this case, uh, we have a much better result with the X-ray because the X-ray is already in a so-called uh, bound prone conformation. While uh, during, the, meta during the, the molecular dynamic simulation, this conformation can be lost and you can also end up in, in, uh, in structure where the accessibility is, uh, uh, let's say, reduced with respect to the, the X-ray structure, and some in which uh, they, they open uh, the, the possibility of binding uh, uh, increase, and this can decrease, let's say, the, the effectiveness of the docking procedure. So in this respect, uh, uh, by looking at how flexible is this particular target, of course, uh, post-processing uh, um, approaches become relevant. And this is uh, the last part of the, of the protocol that we need to fix, uh, that is the, about the post-processing. So we have uh, several types of post-processing going in our consortium. For instance, the group of uh, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center use a microstate model to estimate the binding uh, path and obtain a normalized uh, uh, ratio of, uh, of, the, of the poses that uh, uh, account for the flexibility of the protein. And uh, uh, the ones, uh, uh, for instance, instead in P, and they are using uh, uh, regression models to combine a different scoring set. And the ones that we plan to use in Julish, and unfortunately, I do not have yet uh, uh, finalized the result here, is uh, on electrostatic rescoring in the first place. And then we plan to, to, to let's say, to, to run extensive metadynamic simulation, not only for uh, for post-processing, but also, let's say, to, uh, to have uh, some uh, enlightenment concerning the mechanism of action of this liga. Of course, the last part of our protocol will be the experimental validation. In our consortium, as correctly said by both Carmine and, uh, and uh, Andrea, we have uh, a, also a experimental group involved that are currently uh, uh, performing phenotypic and uh, biochemical screening. And so this will be essentially uh, fundamental to establish also uh, a, to, to further refine our, uh, our screening and to also 
to uh, to open up toward uh, uh, I mean the, the drug design uh, the drug design phase. The last step is of course to understand the chemical phase to to understand uh, let's say uh, which is the uh, the, the relationship between the, scaf the, the chemical active scaffold and the biological activity. And in this respect, Yulish uh, has developed uh, an automatized tool for clusterizing the chemical space that will be soon available to, as an open uh, web server to the overall community. And um, essentially, it is based on the principle that to the final clusterization, you need essentially three uh, ingredients. One, you have to understand how to represent your, your, uh, your molecules. And there are several fingerprints that you can use and that uh, might, have, might provide different performances depending of the, of the chemical features of the, of the group of molecules that you're looking at. Then you need a metric to measure the, the similarity between the two molecules. For instance, one of the most common is the Tanimoto index. And then you need uh, oh, clustering algorithm, for instance, one of the most used is the hierarchical clustering. So what we have done in Yulish, we have uh, uh, set it up uh, or automatized the protocol that allow us to, uh, to test all the possible fingerprint for all the possible, let's say, number of, uh, of cluster in, in your radical clustering and all the possible, uh, let's say, um, metric that uh, tells you in a visual way uh, what is the best clusterization given the, uh, the chemical space uh, that you are uh, uh, that you have as an outcome of your screening? And the visualization is this kind of matrix where on the diagonal you have uh, all the cluster, and that each uh, square is colored accordingly to the chemical similarity. So you can immediately see which are good and bad clusterization. In other words, you can immediately see which are the clusterization that minimize the difference among the cluster, maximizing the ones across, uh, I mean, uh, the different clusters. So now uh, at the end of this procedure, we hope uh, that uh, uh, we, we will uh, uh, provide a, a number of compounds that uh, is, uh, let's say, ready to use uh, for uh, experimental and clinical testing. And this is actually the real, uh, I mean, uh, take home message of, the, of my talk and also in the overall uh, consortium. So the, the drug design pipeline, even if you do that report, is still very long and very, and very risky. And in this respect, uh, the, the most uh, risky steps are from the basic uh, resource from the, let's say, from the discovery phase to the preclinical space and from the preclinical to the clinical trials. And in this respect, the partnership with the pharma company, in our case is Don't Pay, uh, could be essential. And this kind of scheme of working is also reflected not only in our, in our consortium, but uh, is something that several funding agencies are uh, uh, pursuing because uh, it can really uh, help in further speed up the process. And indeed, our group, and I mean, in Julish, collaborate uh, with several pharma company because this can really uh, make the difference in when you want to, to find the solution fast. And at the end, the importance of our consortium is uh, uh, beyond this current, uh, let's say, coronavirus uh, pandemic, because what we are doing, or what we are at least trying to do, is to put in place uh, a, a, a network of uh, interaction between computational and pharma company groups that will be that will be in place and ready to respond also to the future pandemic and not only network of interaction are necessary but also infrastructure and in this respect for instance when you are dealing with computational methodologies each computational methodology needs its own computer architecture its own type of computational resources and up to now, it was very challenging to combine all the different requirements in automatized workflow and pipeline for, for drug discovery. And uh, Yulish is working since a couple of years in this, on this concept of modular computing, where uh, uh, you can, uh, let's say, uh, tailor each task of your protocol to the architecture and the computational resources that you need. 
So for instance, if you need to perform a performance simulation, you need a specific uh, ar architecture that is uh, different from the one that you need if you want to, to use the data science approach with machine learning. And again, it might be slightly different from the ones that you use for with a screening. And this uh, platform can be uh, uh, extremely um, useful for essentially a fast, uh, let's say, response to uh, to the virus, because uh, unfortunately, uh, all of us know that uh, this is not uh, the last uh, pandemic that probably we will uh, we will need to handle. And uh, this consortium, the Excellent for COVID, uh, is starting is start to put in place exactly this network of interaction and infrastructure. And I spoke here about Yulish, that because is, this is the ones that I know better because I'm from Yulish. But uh, similar things are happening also in the other supercomputing centers. And this is just to say that when we coordinate uh, our effort together, because at, at the end, uh, drug repurposing and, and, uh, and, and um, discovery is not something that can be in the domain on one, on, on one expertise only, so it needs a multidisciplinary expertise, uh, is uh, uh, this kind of network is fundamental and it helps us in establish also, uh, let's say, um, network and connection with different fields. And, um, and so this is uh, essentially, uh, the main uh, uh, broad scope of uh, believe of this, uh, uh, of this project that goes beyond the current uh, the current uh, uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. With this, I would like to to thank the people that actually did the majority of the work. That are three PhD students, Jonas, Benjamin, and Simone, and uh, to senior uh, Francesco and Emiliano that uh, is our uh, IT responsible and really help us in setting up uh, uh, all the computational approaches that we needed. And then of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, Paolo Carloni and Thomas Lipper that uh, really support this project with uh, scientific discussion and uh, substantial uh, resources. And finally, I would like also to thank all the people in the consortium of the Excalate for COVID and of course you for your attention. So thank you very much, Julia, for this uh, fascinating overview of the kind of work that you are doing. Um, so I would like to start by thanking all the speakers, of course, and by thanking the people who have joined us in, in this webinar for asking several interesting questions that I will now try to relay. Now, I have seen on the chat that there has also been some interesting discussion among people who are looking at us. I will not summarize that largely because it goes beyond my competencies. So let me start by telling you uh, what a few of the questions that we have received are. Um, so some are quite specific and other are more broad and maybe we can start from the broader ones which I guess have to do with an overall assessment or, or uh, asking about what is your opinion about the most promising uh, strategy to combine all the different aspects, both in the computational task and in the uh, combination of this computational task with the rest of the project. Maybe Andrea, you can start by telling us how important or how connected this computational task is with the rest of the project. Yes, thank you for the question. <clears throat> in fact, it's essentially the point as correctly um, stated by, by Julia. So we are trying to investigate uh, as much as possible uh, the potentiality of different approach. So this is the reason why we are using five different talking tools at the same time and why we are investigating so much the, the effect uh, of the simulation that, that we are going to perform. We have in this project uh, a very nice opportunity because uh, uh, 7,000 molecules that we are using in our validation models uh, already presented will be experimentally validated in biochemical assays. So at the end of the second step, uh, as mentioned, we will have uh, a, a really high quality level of data collected in a single uh, uh, institution with high reproducibility to validate uh, the entire set of the model. And at the same time, we also the chance in this consortium to obtain a crystal structure for this molecule in a high throughput manner. 
So this is, uh, I think, a unique, uh, in, my, in my experience, uh, example where uh, all the computational stuff uh, and procedure we put in place will be fully validated both uh, experimentally and, bo and also uh, with the resolution of uh, the 3D structure of the molecular bound. All this uh, experiment uh, will lend us to have uh, an extreme uh, uh, complete uh, knowledge of the systems involved in the virus replication. Because in the second phase of the project, the very, the very big aim is to identify novel inhibitors with an optimized profile for patients. So anything that we are doing here is uh, devoted to the assessment of the highest quality of the uh, molecular simulation we can, uh, we can do to make sure that in the next level generation libraries that we are going to, to build up at the highest chance to be effective in the treatment. Thank you, Andrea. So let's go to uh, a few slightly more technical questions. Um, some of them have to do with the type of force fields that you guys are using in conjunction with Romans and not. So in general, what kind of force fields are you planning to use in MD simulations with Gromax? Carmine or Giulia? Yes, we are using uh, Amber 99. And uh, as, I, I, as I show you, uh, we are using the last version of Gromax engine uh, integrating with the uh, Amber 99 force field. Okay, and in particular, someone pointed out that ORF3 has a very weak homology, and so they want to know if you're using an ab initio model for this. Yes, this is a very good question. And in our case, we are using a, an optimized model um, that was um, uh, built by the FAIH laboratory that coming from um, a Benicio, a Benicio structure that uh, was built from uh, DeepMind group by using the AlphaFold algorithm. Okay, thank you. Julia, you mentioned acceleration methods. Now there are a couple of connected questions. The first one is, um, do you have a feeling and how do you plan to take into account entropy contributions in the schemes that you have just described? Yeah, entropy contribution is a very difficult one uh, to be included in a simple docking uh, experiments. And uh, that's why uh, in this respect, uh, the post-processing become uh, relevant because you can for sure account for the entropy contribution with uh, post-processing. Namely, for instance, uh, with the metadynamic simulation, you can have an evaluation of the uh, free energy, including the entropic contribution. So uh, is very, uh, there are several, uh, let's say, uh, empirically based uh, methodologies, fast methodologies to try to include this contribution in docking, for instance, uh, by sampling uh, the conformational space of the, uh, of the ligand and also by doing conformational, uh, uh, by considering different conformation of the, of the proteins, but still uh, this uh, uh, is, uh, is a good point, it's a good starting point, but it's not, uh, let's say, a final answer. To, to really encounter in, uh, in a little bit more uh, quantitative way of the entropic contribution, uh, I think that the most rigorous way is to go, uh, is during the post-processing. So with uh, uh, simulation methodologies and free energy, uh, free energy uh, uh, calculation, uh, like for instance, metadynamics that we plan indeed to use. Following up on that, I guess the question would be what kind of reaction coordinates would you like to use and how would you go about choosing them? Yeah, um, well, let's say that uh, uh, in metadynamics, the most common uh, reactive coordinates that are used when you deal with, uh, with uh, ligand binding is uh, the distance between the center of masses and the number of uh, contacts between uh, the atoms of the ligands and the atoms of the, of the binding site. And you can then retailer this in hydrophobic or electrostatic contact, depending on of the nature of the residues in the binding site. In this case, for the protease in particular, I believe that uh, uh, these two might not be the most uh, uh, effective one 
for the fact that you need to encounter also of the highly mobility of the flanking region. So most probably, I, I mean, I, uh, we are start setting up this, uh, so most probably to have a good uh, and fast convergence, we would need to, to put also a, a collective variable on the, on the, um, on the conformation, especially of the of the lower loop, but as I said, this we are still investigating. I mean, uh, but this is I mean uh, the flexibility of the of the flanking region needs to be included because uh, it is a relatively low uh, uh, motion, and this is exactly where you need to put your bias. I mean, to, to, to have a fast conversion. So we are exactly evaluating this in these days. This is a personal curiosity. Do you expect solvent to have a major effect in this situation? I do expect solvent to have um, a, a, an important role because, for instance, uh, one person from uh, from our uh, from our consortium, Vito Village, shows that there is a, a good correlation uh, in the post-processing between the solvent accessible surface of the molecule once it is in the binding site and the way in which they go out with the with the biological activity. And so based on this data and also by looking at how the, the binding site close up on the, on the, on the molecule upon binding, I, I suppose that the, the solvent accessibility and therefore the solvent will, will play an important role here. Thank you. Uh, Carmen, going back to something you said during your talk, you mentioned that the trajectories that you guys are producing will be uh, stored in a repository and made accessible. So the question is, uh, where, when, and how do we know about it? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, we are planning to release um, uh, this repository uh, in, um, I think, in a week or 10 days. And um, we are planning to um, uh, to uh, set up this repository and uh, thanks to uh, uh, our partner um, consortium, that is the um, ENFN, the, um, the Institution of uh, um, Nuclear Physics, and that um, can give us will give us the opportunity to 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 store uh, these huge amounts of data in 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 their uh, storage. And what kind of metadata will you associate with this? I, I think that we can, uh, we will release some um, metadata relating to the uh, the protein, so information relating to the protein, and then we will uh, release um, via uh, via link uh, um, the the possibility to to access to the um, the all the the trajectories. So you can download the, the, the trajectory file and then you can use it as, um, in, in your, uh, with your methods. You can um, have a sampling, a sampling methods that we, we can apply on this trajectory and, and so on. And I guess that the moment you release this repository will be advertised on your website. So maybe the best advice that we can Absolutely. give. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are planning to to release um, a, a sort of flash communication in the in the special issue that I showed uh, in the last slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a question about: uh, uh, Is it possible that the X-ray structure doesn't correspond to the functional state of the protein that we are looking at? Um, yes, of course. I mean. Uh, uh, it could be um, that is not a functional state, but uh, right now, uh, I mean, uh, we do not have any way to 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 test this. So that's why uh, we we took the the binding uh, the, the 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 bound conformation you with a non-covalent ligand. We could have taken also, for instance, the alpha structure. We could have taken uh, the structure of the protease uh, in complex with the covalent inhibitor. But uh, we do not, I mean, we try to, uh, this configuration are uh, present some small local but significant difference at the level of the binding site, especially for the protease. 
And so uh, we try to, to take the ones that is more, uh, was closer to the, the type of uh, in silico experiments that we want to do. And that's why we, we took the, the bound state with on non-covalent ligand because uh, we can assume that this is the most similar one that we would experience in the presence of the ligand, of course. But it's an assumption, it's like. Of course, this is part of the modeling business, I guess. Yeah. Have you taken into account the role of sugars? Another question that we got from the audience. Uh, right now, uh, I mean, uh, mm, I mean, from uh, from this initial uh, uh, phase, uh, not yet. I mean, uh, this doesn't mean that we we will not do in the in the future because what we are trying to do is, I believe, uh, uh, general protocol that you can apply it on different targets. So uh, right now, sugar are not uh, have not been. I mean, at least from the Ulish uh, group, have not been considered. I do not know if from, from the payoff for. Uh, has been considered, but right now we didn't uh, include this uh, yet in the in the evaluation. Carmine or Andrea, uh, feel free to jump in. Eh? I mean, this is very open. No, no, no. We are not including the the sugar in our simulation. Okay. Let's see what else have we got. Ah, uh, some people are wondering whether you could comment a bit on the role of machine learning in this type of uh, screening processes. Um. Well, Andrea, you go or I go? No, please, sir. Please, please. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, machine learning is uh, a technique that is, uh, uh, despite it's becoming very cool in these uh, last days, but it was known <laughs> in the in the field of uh, of the modeling. I think since uh, since nineteen <laughs> since the, since. Uh, uh, because uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, especially computational docking has always used uh, uh, simple, at the beginning, simple regression model to, to increase uh, the, the, the quality of the, of the results. So, and regression models are the first stage of, uh, of machine learning. So, and uh, so this is a technique that is uh, very well uh, known. And uh, in general, machine learning technique uh, are uh, showing uh, to be uh, to have a very good performance, at least comparable with the physics-based one in the docking, in the in the molecular docking field. And the reason is that essentially what you do with the docking by combining the searching algorithm with the scoring algorithm, what you are doing there is actually you are trying to maximize the number of, uh, of true positive and minimize the number of uh, false. Uh, positive. And uh, essentially, this is uh, like a, a, a binary type of problem. So you can uh, easily do this uh, with a machine learning type of approach because you can, uh, I mean, uh, uh, tailor, you can train your, uh, your uh, machine learning algorithm in order to do exactly this, to maximize the, the true positive and minimize uh, the false one without not really the necessities of going in details of why, of, of, which are the physical base of why oligan is true positive, why is, is, uh, is not. So in this respect, uh, the type of, uh, uh, of problems that docking uh, uh, encounter are uh, very suitable for machine learning types of approaches. And that's why their performance is good. The only problem with all the machine learning approaches is that you need to have, of course, a sufficiently large uh, training set because the, the, I mean, for all the people that apply this methodology, it's very well known that the, um, the quality of the result depend on the statistical significance of the training set, and this has to be large. And this is not always possible for all the, for all the systems, I mean, uh, for, all the, for all the target that you have. In the case of the protease, it is, and indeed, uh, I believe that uh, um, in our consortium, there is especially one, uh, uh, one team that is uh, using uh, uh, regression model to combine different scoring functions in order to maximize uh, the recognition of the active molecules. And this, and this is, a, let's say, a first uh, machine learning type of, uh, of approach, of course. 
Thank you. You, you mentioned the importance of uh, the right computer architecture to support this computational chain. Someone was curious in particular to know if there is room for uh, GPUs to speed up process. Yeah, of course, but I think that Andrea can, can answer. There is a lot of room. Uh, in fact, we use, uh, I mean, GPU uh, in uh, uh, most of the relevant part. Of course, uh, all the MD simulation are run on uh, uh, multi-GPU uh, nodes, for sure. And also, for example, uh, our docking program, uh, uh, Ligen, uh, is, uh, is a fully uh, GPU-based uh, uh, algorithm. So uh, I think that uh, the, the, the usage of the GPUs uh, and also now with the possibility of use also uh, more, uh, uh, I mean, advanced like tensor uh, application in the new GPC, GP, uh, GPUs, uh, because tensor can use uh, uh, the same application for uh, rotating things uh, in a four dimensional matrix uh, can be readapted uh, for docking procedure. So I think that now we, uh, as, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have more complex uh, architecture that uh, give us the opportunity to tune and select uh, for different stage of the algorithm, different architecture we can find in the same machine on a network. So uh, also for achieve uh, uh, exascale uh, level simulation, we have to understand that we are combined uh, the strongest uh, potential of each uh, architecture to, 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 to obtain this result. So this is fundamental. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have one question uh, which asks, if you are trying molecules of essential oils reputed to be antiviral, eucalyptus, laurius, uh, Well, I think that uh, in the second stage, when we will screen, uh, uh, let's say, larger library, we can also screen a natural compound. I mean, uh, this uh, can be can be done, of course. Uh, uh, this is actually the once we know which are the the active scaffold from a chemical point of view, then uh, there is the possibility that these uh, are also available in the natural uh, substances like uh, essential oils. So for sure, I mean, this could be a category of compound that can be included, I believe, in the follow-up screen. I mean, right now our work was mostly focused in really trying to, to, to understand the protocol that allow us to recognize the active uh, molecules. And, and we need a very precise set with, uh, uh, with uh, let's say, measured affinity <laughs> experimentally because Okay, and sure. some of these compounds, maybe there are experimental data, but maybe they are very generic. Maybe they are classified as genetic antiviral compound, but you don't know exactly which protein they are targeting. So you need to really to, to go toward uh, these co the, the compounds for which uh, uh, the screening was directed against uh, a specific target. So this is why they were not included in the initial uh, part of our protocol, I believe. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. Um, I just have one final general question and then I will uh, leave the floor to Ignacio who may tell us if there have been more questions while I was uh, asking this first batch. Um, I, I'm very impressed uh, in, this, in this moment by this uh, willingness to share data, to share trajectories. Uh, this is something that Eric Lindell mentioned also in our first webinar, as you know very well, since you are collaborating with him. In the next webinar, there will also be the description of another initiative by Modesto Orozco in Barcelona and their consortium. So I think it's very, very important that everybody is aware of the existence of all these calculations so as to avoid repetitions and save time. And I am also very impressed about the willingness and, and the capability in particular of your consortium to create these uh, public-private enterprises. Um, so provocative question, what about intellectual property? At what point does that become a problem? <laughs> this I leave to the, to the pharma company. <laughs> that question wasn't targeted at you. <laughs> very, very nice question. And uh, of course, is a, is a point. Uh, um, so once he is a, first of all, is a requirement from the commission. That I mean, we fully agree, but it's a, it's a, it's part of the agreement with the commission 
that once uh, we are uh, using public funds, we have to make available all the results uh, within one month. So um, we, I mean, fully embrace this, and, uh, and of course, uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, is reasonable also because we can uh, leverage the results from this different group. We use data coming from literature and other group to enhance our model, and for sure we want to release our results to make. Uh, um, to also to give the other people the possibility to use our data to go uh, even further our results. From the IP perspective, uh, is, uh, um, we are thinking about at the moment, uh, it is possible uh, in principle to file uh, uh, patents very fast within the period uh, that is required for the disclosure of the results. And uh, I think we can, uh, both have, uh, I mean, we can demonstrate that it's possible to protect the result without uh, obscuring uh, to the community the outcome, uh, the scientific outcome. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in 30 days, it's possible to file a patent and protect the results, uh, but it's also guaranteed that the rest uh, of the scientific community can take the full advantage of the results. Thank you, Andrea. Ignacio, I am done with the list of questions that I had noted during the talk. Uh, so yeah, I think you addressed more of them, most of them, uh, maybe a couple of uh, additional curiosities. There, there have been a few questions associated more to the structure and properties of the, of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so maybe a general question is, uh, you have emphasized the efforts to identify these drugs. Are you also uh, performing computational efforts uh, or trying to understand the parts of the behavior of the of the virus itself. For example, they they ask about how much is known about channel forming proteins, or for example, uh, the response of these proteins to temperatures and their performance. So, um, are you also have done or plan to do activities in this direction? So, um, at the moment, we. Um... We do not uh, take in consideration these specific aspects, but um, for sure uh, we will put a, um, we will take a look to to these additional um, differences among uh, uh, viral behavior, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and then uh, another which is more about the consortium itself. You you have emphasized the the role of of having all these computation activities to identify drugs and then that can be passed or uh, can motivate then preclinical and clinical tests eventually. Is there uh, the fact that you have this consortium facilitates also a, a feedback? What, what is the interaction between what you find uh, computationally and then what is done in the lab and to which extent there is also suggestion from further work in the in the lab back to, to uh, further or new computational activities? Yes, we are very integrated in the parts. Uh, and uh, I think it's one of the strength of this consortium uh, is to have uh, from the beginning uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our understanding the, the highest quality of molecular simulation uh, and uh, supported by the highest quality of experimental validation. So once we have uh, all this data combined, uh, uh, we will try to use uh, all the experience uh, uh, in a mm, uh, cross-functional teams uh, to try to extract as much as possible the understanding the systems. Because for example, we generate data for phenotypic screen uh, and then we have to deconvolve with data, one side with the biochemical uh, experiments. But of course, we will have at the end just six uh, biochemical assays out of 25 uh, possible proteins. So the computational part uh, in the prediction of the polypharmacology of the molecules, when we have all the model validated, will support uh, a lot uh, the understanding uh, of the phenotypic screen in the virus replication. Because our final goal is to find the combination of, of drugs that uh, is able to produce the, the, the most responsive treatment. And of course, understanding of the molecular mechanism, molecular level of the interaction is fundamental to find 
the most relevant combination of drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe one last question. Uh, again, probably it's more looking into the future. You, you have talked about having these standards to do uh, this molecular modeling in, in a, in a well-defined way. There, there, are, there is a question about whether uh, or not you're planning or what is the potential you see to develop multi-scale computational approaches in this respect. Yeah, I think uh, I can speak from, uh, from the Jurich point of view, of course, uh, and uh, I can tell that we are uh, already doing so. So our institute is currently developing uh, multi-scale uh, uh, approaches uh, to deal with uh, 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 for modeling biomolecule and their interaction uh, with uh, ligand. We have uh, multi-scale approaches uh, starting at the level of uh, QMMM, and we collaborate in this respect with the IBM and with the group of uh, Ursula Rotisberger in APFL. We have a multi-scale approach for uh, higher scale, like for the cosgrain and MM molecular simulation. And we have, uh, uh, I mean, in our institute, there is uh, uh, up to development of uh, this code uh, to uh, to use the sorts of for, uh, for fast screening, so in the long term. So of course, we are developing also multi-scale simulation because it is true that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you need a multi-scale approach to have a current understanding of the mechanism of action of a drug. And uh, this cannot be left behind. So uh, this is part of our, of our grand picture, of course, at least from the Eulish side. And our group in particular, our institute in particular, is really doing uh, I mean, advancing in this uh, in this respect. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much to all of you. I think we have had a very uh, nice and interesting set of presentations on on this new initiative, and I think the, also the discussion will have uh, helped uh, the attendees. I think we have covered most of the questions that have been posed during during the webinar, and uh, so thank you, Andrea, Carmine, and Julia. And I, as I explained at the beginning, we store this uh, webinar, the presentations in the CCAM website. Because this is an ongoing project, uh, news associated to the project will also be linked into our webpage. So you can, need to, you can come back and, and see through, web, through the CCAM uh, page uh, the advances on, on the project. And I invite all of you to come back uh, next Monday for the third seminar of the series. We will be sending the announcement later in the week. So I hope to see you all back again. And thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.